Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to have been asked to say a few words in the context of the conference on public governance in a global risk society on occasion of the 100th anniversary of Xiamen University. I will do so on the topic of what the master teaches, lessons from Confucian public administration for public governance in a global risk society. Now, when 270 years ago, the Xianlong Emperor ruled, it was clear that China was not only the main global power, but also the best administered one. And that was very important because public management, and this is my personal topic today, public management in China was holding the state together and indeed giving it not only administration, but also dynamics and direction, as well as economic success. The most popular stories of imperial China always feature a bureaucratic element. The world is an administered one, and even the monkey king rebels because he doesn't get what he thinks is the proper civil service rank for him in the celestial administration. But then comes the great decline, the great divergence of China, uh, comparatively speaking, inside and outside, that Max Weber the leading theorist of bureaucracy describes with a stronger ascendancy of Western rationalized administrative ways and how to implement them. This is not really a question anymore, but it led to attempts of Westernization and modernization of which surely the foundation of the University of Amoy is part. Now, the world has changed since then once again, and the leadership of China today is hardly in question. In fact, we have questioned global Western Northern models of administration in the sense that they don't have global validity, but perhaps only regional ones. Now, this being the case, in the question of Chinese renewed dominance, there are basically two options that you can take of why this is so. My former dean at Lee Kuan Yew School at National University of Singapore, Kishore Mahubani, has in a book called Has China Won, suggested that this may be the case simply because Asians, as he would generally say, are just better Westerners today than the Westerners themselves. So Weber's suggestion of Occidental rationalism should really be corrected into Oriental rationalism today. The other option is to say that the entire concept has run its course and in reality the strength of the East is being as traditionally Eastern as you can. And that in the Chinese case means a return to genuine Chinese traditions which in public administration are usually labeled Confucianism. So Confucian public administration is basically the state management principles that were development during the Chinese empire from the Song dynasty to the end of the Manchu dynasty in 1904-1905, including the famous civil service exam. So the question is, what of these two models, or maybe a combination thereof, is the successful model? But successful it is. And if, like me, you teach non-Western public administration of which Chinese or Confucian PA is a decisive part, one of the questions that students often ask is what of the very successful public administration institutions, forms, ideas, can we transfer to the global Northwest or even to countries from other spheres that for their development pushes would like to learn from China as well. It is a question that literally comes up in any class or lecture I deliver on the subject. And I thought to develop this, what the lessons from Chinese public administration are for global student audiences, because our student audiences are rather global, would be interesting in the Chinese context. I'm not presuming to tell you what the great heritage of Confucian public administration is. I do want to point out of what people think 
they can learn from. The first area that I want to cover as something that has always been perceived as particularly interesting from China for the West is corruption and nepotism and how to deal with this. This is, of course, a running theme in Chinese history of bureaucracy. But other than the fact that corruption is culturally connotated and it does mean different things in different places at different times, one of the most interesting contributions of the Chinese tradition here is, of course, the civil service exam. Because the civil service exam, which is probably the longest lasting public management institution in the history of mankind, and one of the most successful ones, as also Max Weber said, the imperial civil service exam in the end did what it was supposed to do for almost a thousand years. The civil service exam was designed primarily in order to break the power of wealthy families and local aristocrats and perhaps the grand bourgeoisie. And it did that because any form of genuine merit selection, while perhaps remaining biased, does remove the threat that jobs are given to nephews whose entire quality is that they are nephews. And that is something that also shows you a choice. Do I want people to be objective and not prefer their nephews? And that is difficult. And it is very culturally, contextually connotated. Or do I say, I design institutions in which the nephewdom doesn't matter so much. And that has always been the Chinese way. In fact, it also led to a centrality or increased even the great centrality of the civil service. It increased the civil service exam, a way of how to build the state on a competent and as objective as possible bureaucracy. The fact alone that the final exams were read to the emperor himself who would then grade the very, very final exams, and that we do have a list of these final successful candidates, is a way of how to ensure that via social prestige, civil service becomes one of the most desirable, yes, indeed, the most desirable careers in imperial China. A complex, large, pre-internet empire like the Chinese one does need a recruitment that gets the best people into the civil service because the natural way would be to go into business. The second concept of classical Chinese public administration that is of so much interest in the global Northwest is the mandate of heaven. Now the mandate of heaven says that heaven as an abstracted form of large-scale religiosity and endorsement by the sky itself is only with a ruler or a dynasty that is successful. In other words, failure in war, in natural catastrophe and so on is a sign that heaven isn't with you anymore. And how that is important for the motivation in a global risk society that failing as far as the global risk is concerned is a main indicator of not being legitimate is important, I think is obvious. Now, what is important here is that the mandate of heaven does not say that if a natural catastrophe happens or if somebody attacks you from the outside that you have lost the mandate of heaven but you have lost the mandate of heaven if you can't cope with it, if you can't solve it. So in other words, a famine does show that you have lost the mandate of heaven, but if you cope with it well, it means you still have it. And this is, of course, one of the biggest, largest scale, most important performance indicators in human civilization. We do not have many similar examples. 
And if indeed you fail to solve such problems, you have to go. Now, one of the things that Max Weber tells us about classical Chinese government, not only him, but in this post anniversary year, it's something that's worth saying, is that the mandate of heaven does not only pertain to the emperor, not even to the government, but to every single civil servant. That means wherever you are in the hierarchy, you need to do your job well. And the big indicator is not micro stuff counted every half year, which is silly anyway, we know that. But it means that you do your job so that people can lead in your area of authority a prosperous, healthy, good life. And this very important large-scale indicator is the reason of why, for instance, a very hierarchical civil service can still be highly innovative. Because if you need innovation to be economically and otherwise successful, if you are not innovative, you will have to go because you are not successful. And so the logic here is that with this very large scale performance requirement, you combine the advantages of agility and stability in a way that is truly trailblazing. But if you have such a large concept of the state, it also may lead to imperial bureaucracy, not only in the sense of a bureaucracy that rules the people in their own interest, but also in the sense that bureaucrats themselves become too obsequious. They say what the ruler or their bosses want to hear, but that is highly dysfunctional because it is bad for the life of the people and it is bad for the government that needs to be told in the Chinese system of what is happening. And the solution that we find in Chinese history is the concept of the Junsi, that means the concept of the gentleman bureaucrat, as Weber also put it, the concept of bureaucrats who owe their status in life, their importance, to the position in the bureaucracy yet who will not do everything in order to stay in their job and to get promoted. One of the biggest pitfalls of systems that are built on a bureaucracy. And sometimes the cliche is that Confucian hierarchy is about obeying, but it's not. It is about obeying to a point. And that point is when government orders cross your sense of ethics and not a sense of personal Western ethics, but that of what is right, what is the way, what is endorsed by the ancestors and by country and world in itself. So the concept of also wanting to do other things, of realizing the importance of poetry, the importance of Painting, the importance of beautiful objects, gives the bureaucrat a life outside of the bureaucracy and the option to quietly retire into the countryside, maybe into a very simple cottage, if he cannot just accept what he is supposed to do. This even pertained to this extremely high level of aesthetic culture within the bureaucracy in itself. You know, perhaps this illustration of a bureaucrat picking up flowers for making flower arrangements for the office with a ritualistic peace-oriented orientation, actually. So this gives bureaucrats the possibility to do what is best, but only to a certain limit. One of the most famous illustrations is in the now not Confucian, but Taoist trinity of Fulu Shu that in many 
areas, especially of southern China and in the Sinisphere, are very prominent and some of the most visibly present figures of Chinese culture, if you will. And of these, Fu, the first one, the deity, if you will, or the immortal of good luck originally, and that is why he is depicted with all these children that on this display from Singapore run all over the place. The children that he is with is actually not something that relates to fertility, but he did protect handicapped children from his province. Originally, he was a deputy governor of a far away province that the royal court was requiring as court jesters. And it was the human that is the basis of Fu in the legend that refused to send them up, saying that the families were hard enough up and that there was no way he could separate the children from their parents. That is what makes him such a great deity that Fulushu, where on a drawing that, as far as we know, the Qianlong Emperor kept in his personal bedroom's antechamber. These are the three little areas that I wanted to point at, which have been some of the most interesting from the global Western perspective, anti-corruption and nepotism and how to fight them. The mandate of heaven as the ultimate performance appraisal. And finally, the nature of the scholar gentleman administrator who will do his very best, but only to a point. I do hope that this was a discussion that was of interest in your context. And I wish you and the conference and the department and Xiamen University all the best for the next 100 years. Universitas Amiensis, vivat, crescat, floreat. Xie xie.